Oh boy, all of the ships are manning the guns. This is gonna be messy no matter what. We open this week with a little recap of everything that happened last week in clearing the stuff with Darzen. Thus, when we cut over to the Hanadera breakfast table, our lead protagonist was understandably not all that hungry. This of course concerned her partner, who was there and saw everything. Her other friends were also taking notice. <laughs> Is that really out of the ordinary for her? Also, I kind of like this little bit of Nyatra and pointing out that's usually stuff Hinata would pull and she had absolutely no reaction. I guess we could kind of consider this character development with Hinata fully acknowledging her shortcomings or a bit of dry humor, you decide. Anyway, Ravelin shared her concerns with the others and they gave some very reasonable advice by saying that she should go talk to her herself as she did understand Nodoka the most. Meanwhile, in the Byogen Kingdom, Shindoinen was reporting to the king that they still hadn't found Darizen. Use the archer clip. Uh, phrasing? The king declined her offer, saying that he didn't want to lose such a loyal underling. Reasonable and probably really smart on his part, though really, I think he's just not into kinky chicks. I don't blame him. On the other side of the coin, in the healing garden, Tia Tinu and her loyal subjects were getting ready to move out. You better keep to that promise, Queenie. We don't need any more bad mentors. I'm watching you. Back with Odaka, Rablin finally decided to help consult her. And in a nice subtle bit, Latte did her part to make sure they were left alone. With that, Rablin told her friend that she would support her if she chose to help Darizin, even if it would go against her own mission. But as it turned out... <laughs> In that moment, she did completely submit to her own fears and trauma and did something that, on paper at least, was very irresponsible and unheroic. I know as this show is wrapping up, some people have mixed feelings about it, myself included, but if anything, I think it has done something important by bringing back a theme that has kind of been forgotten about, the importance of responsibility and accountability. Sometimes it's not just enough to be diligent in their efforts to protect everyone. The Precure also have to make difficult choices that require more than a little contemplation and reflection on their part. Otherwise, they could end up making mistakes that will cost them dearly. I think a big problem that has plagued a lot of toy protagonists, not just Precure, has been their recklessness. And I get it, they want to promote that kids should feel free to spread their wings and all that jazz, but, and okay, maybe this is just my concern, uncle instincts kicking in, you gotta set limits and show your viewers that every choice will have a consequence. And yet, even when these so-called heroes make objectively wrong choices, they're never called out. Thankfully, this does seem to have been corrected with the more recent seasons like Kira Major, and of course, here. Nodoka chose to become a heroine to all, and now has to live with all of the responsibilities that comes with. Yeah, it's kind of that old adage from Spider-Man and all that. She does need to consider the feelings of all of those around her, friend and foe alike, otherwise she really would become the hypocrite that Darizin accused her of being. All of that said, though... Just as she has responsibilities to all of those around her, Nodoka also has a responsibility to her own being. Not everyone needs to be or should be a total martyr. Sure, Precure in theory should sacrifice a part of themselves for the greater good, but only when truly necessary. And considering what Darizen has put her and her family through as I've mentioned in the past, she shouldn't exactly feel obligated to help him. And that's not even getting into the real life meta context where we have only just started on the road to recovery after the pandemic. So it's not exactly a good message to say that we should help the anthropomorphic virus. And yet, many Precure would probably choose to help the villain in this situation. I'll say right now, as I was watching this, I was thinking this could be a make or break moment, not just for this episode, but for this entire show. So, let's see how they do. Ravlin simply asked for her honest feelings, not her feelings as Kier Grace, but as Nodoka Hanadera. And of course, she really didn't want to help the bastard. Ravlin, could you 
please at least guest star in Tropical Rouge? I mean, by the sounds of it, the seal is going to be a regular Amaru, and I'm sure you would be able to whip it back into shape. I mean, at this point, I have nothing else to say about this bunny. She is beyond S-tier partner at this point, saying that she would do anything for Nodoka. <laughs> Elsewhere, the source of all of this distress was at his wit's end, as he knew it was only a matter of time before the king found him. Thus, even though he's been against using the mega parts from the very beginning, he decided to use the entirety of his remaining stock on himself. Though, since he wasn't quite as fortified as Gwaiwaru and seemed to use more than 10 here, it didn't exactly give him a regal appearance. The Precure engaged Safer Daru in a really nicely done fight, as not only was the action really well animated and choreographed, but of course, we also got the climax to this little rivalry. <laughs> Ari used you for Shindoin in, so we're not going to use it here. But yeah, at this point, Darizen was literally on his knees begging for help. And again, under most circumstances, a pre-cure would help a villain in need, but Nodoka first asked the most pertinent question, what would he do after she helped him? Would he continue to infect the earth and make people suffer? Because if that were the case, then that would go against her main mission as Cure Grace. But more importantly, Nodoka Hanadera didn't want to help him. <laughs> Well put, Nautica. Well put. With her friends supporting her with some fire spins and ice beams, Nautica managed to fully overwhelm her former tormentor. I pity the parents who will have to explain the scene to their kids. With that, Darizen was taken down in one of the most ungraceful positions ever, and they tried to finish him off with the arrows, but his resilience and the fortification of the mega parts prevented him from being fully purified. This proved to be the worst result as Shindoinen found him and revealed his location to her king. And while he was left with only a base form Darizen, it was enough to allow the king to further evolve into... Not gonna lie, I would kind of sim for this guy too. That's yeah, another awesome design. With that, Neo King Byokin, a name Shindoinen really wanted to reinforce, was ready to take over, but the Precure weren't going to hand over the earth so easily. With that, the episode ended with the Neo King guy guest reading Darizen's memories to remind Nodoka how she had just abandoned him a minute ago. He pointed out how, again, Precure should protect everyone, but Nodoka stood firm in her choice and rightfully pointed out that he was the last guy who had any right to say that, and that she was ready to take him down too. I'll admit, I didn't see all of this coming, but honestly, I'm glad they subverted my expectations, because unlike certain other big name franchises, this actually made a whole lot of sense, and it also raised our main heroine up into the upper echelon. Nodoka, I think I speak for all of us when I say we're going to miss you. While I do expect Precure to sometimes cover more mature themes, I didn't expect them to cover all of this in a single finale. First, I really do appreciate how they covered both sides of the Help Darizen conundrum. A Precure's duty to protect all is imperative, but not necessarily absolute. After all, is it really worth saving someone if many more are just going to suffer as a result? Choosing the morally right choice isn't always the best choice. Moreover, there is also the human aspect. If a Precure can't choose for themselves, then they would just be an assassin for hire by a bunch of cute little mascots. Though this mascot probably wouldn't let that happen either. Rablin's scene with Nodoka was handled so well and tastefully that it might be one of my favorite scenes in this entire franchise. Just her comforting her friend and telling her she shouldn't live with regrets was beyond inspiring. And of course, Nodoka pulled her weight too. No longer was she the weak little girl who could barely run a few feet, but now someone who could stand firm against her former tormentor, which yes, there were some overt themes here that could be interpreted as stuff that I can't really talk about on this platform. Then again, I have kind of talked about it in the past, but that was with Kamikita Futago Precure manga, and they indulge in darker themes that you usually wouldn't find on this Sunday morning show until now apparently. Granted, this wasn't 
quite as blatant as Emir's relationship with the Heat 900, and again, it was handled tastefully for the most part. Though, just so that we're clear, I do really like Darizen as a villain, and actually hope he comes back for the finale, if only so that he and Nodoka can end things on their own terms, as this rivalry deserves that much. Though, even if that doesn't happen, it was just so satisfying to see Nodoka standing tall not only against Darizen, but even the Neo King, who even from this angle is looking a lot shorter than her right now. Nodoka has had quite the journey, and you know, I get the feeling it's only just beginning for her. If you haven't seen it yet, I made two videos analyzing the newly announced main cast of Tropical Rouge. Then again, you probably should know about that since y'all kept messaging me about it. Thanks a lot for that. So seriously, I am sorry I can't make more videos since I've become really busy lately, but still, I do hope you guys can enjoy what I was able to make on short notice. I took a look at each of the actresses more notable roles as well as looked at some interviews they did for the official website. It's definitely looking like we're going to get a much more balanced cast as well as a little more focus on comedy next season so those are things to look forward to. But for now, I am done with Tropical Rouge videos and as soon as I see that, they'll probably make another big announcement. Yeah, can you tell I pre-record some of this stuff? Anyway, let's do a quick trailer reaction to Tropical Rouge. Sure enough, I Fire Uzu as Manatsu opened the trailer with a kind of higher pitched Hibiki Sakura voice which matches well with this character. We then got some nice shots of this new setting of the Blue Sky City, including their beach that was right in front of some buildings. Kind of reminds me of where I live, near Alamana Beach Park. From there, we got a few cuts of Laura, including one of the faces I think Ria Hidaka was hinting at and uh -huh. Well, gotta do it. We then see the characters meet and uh, hey Manatsu, you probably shouldn't touch the tail. For all you know, that could be some not good touch territory, just saying. We then saw one of the generals of the season who, uh, yeah. Well, so much for you pretty boys. Shoo shoo shoo. I mean, it's not a bad design. I guess he's supposed to be a blue crab, but why the ascot? Like, dude, are you a fan of Fred Jones or something? And why are you a fan of Fred? From there, Laura got captured and just looked annoyed that she had been captured and is that the first monster of the week? Yep, we've officially entered into joke season territory, folks! Start buckling down while you still can. We then got a little bit of Monatsu's transformation with her compact opening up very a la mode. Eh. And yes, as everyone were quick to point out in one of my earlier videos, her precious item from her mom was not her lips, but rather some lipstick. Personally, I don't know why they said Ripu instead of Kuchibe, but whatever semantics. And of course, the animation here was looking really nice and smooth, which is kind of necessary for a stock animation. And with that, the trailer wrapped up, and yeah, I think we're looking good so far. Quick thoughts, some nice bright colors so far, I really like the setting, mostly due to a bit of a hometown bias, and yeah, this is gonna be one hell of a joke season, ain't it? Oh boy. I mean, the interviews with the actresses, especially Ai Fairozu and Rina Hidaka, kind of gave it away, but oh boy, we might be in for a regular old smile season. Which is understandable, after the dumpster fire that was 2020, we all kind of need a little bit of a laugh. Still, even for a comedy season, some of these villain designs look a little much to me. I mean, unless this guy is voiced by Clancy Brown, I'm not even sure if I can see him as a legit threat or not. <laughs> okay, enough. But I don't know, maybe I'm just being too picky, and really, that's just a minor nitpick because I am already loving Laura, as just from these shots, I think it's pretty clear she has a lot of personality and is not taking any sort of nonsense. Rina Hidaka probably gave away too much when talking about this character. And while it's hard to gauge how good the animation is going to be just from this and the transformation sequence that has to look good, I am liking the designs and colors so far. Still, what are your guys' thoughts on this trailer? Feel free to comment below, and now back to your regularly scheduled program. But unless it is something really significant, I am just going to focus on some of my other projects for now. So look forward to those, and until then though, farewell for now my friends, and uh... Yep, they've started. Uh, better start bunkering down more than usual, guys.